Good morning, good evening. Namaste. Good evening, Uncle. Hi, Shenzhen. How are you doing? Yes, I'm well. Hope okay. we are well too. Yeah, pretty good. Uh, let's all pay our respects to you. Let's bow three times together. First bow. Second bow. Third bow. So shall we start with some meditation as usual, Shunzian? Yes, Long Paul. Okay. So everyone, I'll, I'll set the clock for half an hour and uh, I'll give a bit of instruction, but let's really use the time of silence, come to the quietness of the mind. Silence is golden. Right, so set yourself up in a good posture. <clears throat> And establish a sense of presence where you are, how you feel. So just, just the body sitting here, knowing what that feels like. So as soon as you do that, you start to compose your attention into the present moment. In a sense of composure, presence, it's actually very simple. So I like to use sound a lot to come into that sense of presence and composure. So listen to sound and let the sounds come to you. So it's not like you're searching for a particular sound or judging a sound. It's just sound, ambient sound, whatever it is. And there's the knowing. Sound is like this. Feel the body sitting here. It's the whole body awareness. Let body sensations become conscious. So you're not focusing on anything particular, just a kind of very open awareness. Listen to sound again. Perceive sound as in awareness. Sound as in awareness. Then feel your body. Only sensations in awareness. So you perceive awareness as conscious space within which sound comes and goes, bodily feelings come and go, thoughts and emotions come and go. And so you're like the witness to change. Feel the breathing of the body. Not a hard focus, just allowing breath to become known. And breathing is in awareness. So composed and collected for one in-breath. And composed and collected for one out-breath.
so this isn't so much concentration as an open attitude of awareness from moment to moment. Awareness accepts all things, rejects none. So open, open hearted awareness for one in breath, one out breath. And just keep returning to that simple attitude as thoughts come and go. Imposing the mind, collecting attention to the way things are. Okay, I'll be quiet and let, let's sit in silence. Yes, we are now request for Dhamma talk. Bama Chaloka Dipati Sahampati Adanjali Divaraya Chata Santi Dasata Araja Kajatika Dese Tudama Anuka Piman Paja Namo Tassa, Pakuato, Arahato, Sama, Samputasa. Namo tassa pakawato arahato sama samputasa. Namo tassa pakawato arahato sama samputasa. Putan damang sankan namasami. <coughs> Hello again, everyone. Hope you're well. Um, we've had, we've all managed to get COVID here which wasn't so smart, <laughs> but at least we all got it, right? It was very kind of sangha feeling about our COVID. But fortunately, none of us were hospitalized and most of us had minor symptoms. And I think it's been what, 10 days now, 11, 11 days. So I think we're out of the communicable part of the, the disease. Unfortunately, we had a big VESAC plan um, for the 15th. As you know, the uh, full moon of May is what we call Vesak, which is the month of Vesak, and we celebrate the life of the Buddha. So we had rented a, a hall, Sivaton Hall, in the nearby town of Perth, Perth, Canada, not Perth, Australia, <coughs> and uh, got sick. So we canceled the whole, whole thing. Um, so there you go. But we're, we're, we're okay. I was in the workshop trying to chop my fingers off and managed not to do that. So everything is good. Um, and then for the birders, most exciting, you know, the Baltimore Oriole has returned. And if you've ever seen a Baltimore Oriole, it is more orange than an orange. It's the most exquisite color. So that's good news. And then the most exciting thing, of course, is that our building of our Dharma Hall is progressing very nicely. And uh, so they, you know, we, the, the, the property we're on is on what we call the Canadian Shield. And 10,000 years ago or such, uh, on the, if, I would have, if I would have lived here, there'd be two kilometers of ice above me. So this was covered in glaciers. And the glaciers sheared all the topsoil and took it down to Pennsylvania or Ohio, somewhere down there, down to the Americans. So they've got all our topsoil. And so here we have a lot of bare rock. So excavation is actually pretty easy. Once we get to bedrock, we can build on that. We don't have any problems with foundations and deep, deep, uh, 
whatever you do in clay soil or places like Bangkok. So they dug out the pit and they filled it with gravel and they, the builders surveyed the land today, the uh, boundary of the building. So that's very exciting. And our builder is an interesting guy. You see, he built the Vihara for our nuns community. About 20 minutes from here, there's a bhikkhuni uh, hermitage. I am made the Nandi uh, is the abbess there. Um, lovely group of women. And he built their sala some years ago. So he's, he's a local builder and he really loves this the Sangha life in our communities. So we feel quite confident. Um, and uh, also, of course, prices are crazy right now. It's the worst time to build uh, and supply chains and so on. And uh, our estimates of what it should be, of course, went crazy. <laughs> And we were really, really nervous, but uh, William and Karina and Michael and Zito, William and Karina in Singapore, Michael and Zito in KL and Vipon in Thailand, they've kind of rallied around to help us with fundraising. So they say, go for it. So we're gonna go for it. And uh, yeah, I'm sure it'll all work out, but it is a bit nerve wracking at times, but this is not the first time I've been involved in this kind of endeavor and it is a, it's a gift to the community really to have to have a place to have a, a dharma hall that is dedicated to peace and silence so in the midst of this war in the ukraine and other wars to be actually involved in creating a peaceful environment feels pretty good feels quite appropriate <clears throat> so like that so we're doing well we're, we're, we're doing okay um in our, in our anagaric from Mexico, Daniel has just returned from Mexico. He got a three-year uh, visa, so that's nice. So we have a small community now. We're four bhikkhus, Ajahn Pavar and myself, Amr Siri, Siri Mado, Anagarka Aiden, Anagarka Daniel, and two lay people. So we're a pretty small community, but we're, we're hardworking. And uh, yeah, it's a... We're all right. Huh? <laughs> so that's us. <clears throat> We're doing all right. Um, so now I have to say something about Buddhism. <laughs> um, I, I read an article in The Guardian, I think it was The Guardian, about a, a pro tennis, a Ukrainian uh, pro tennis player who's been on the pro circuits for about 15 years, if I remember correctly, sort of at the end of his career. And uh, he's enlisted in the Ukrainian army. And so one of the questions people sometimes ask is, is killing every morally justified? That question doesn't really work in Buddhism because no matter what you do, your mind still experiences it. So this, say this fellow, he has a family, I think, um, can't, his family, his wife and two kids are outside of Ukraine. His parents and grandparents and brothers are in Kiev. So he leaves the family, gets his parents out, gets much of the family out and lists in the army. Then he goes to Bucha or Bucha, the, the place where the atrocities were near Kiev. And he sees the atrocities and he's horrified and he says, if I see a Russian soldier, I'll know what I do. And so he will probably be involved in killing or will kill. And you could say that, that you know, Ukrainian nationalists would say that's justified and, and who's to blame the man, but still his mind, his, we all know his mind is gonna be a total mess at the end of this war or already. And, and so Buddhism doesn't really have some kind of ethical norm where you can or can't do this. Buddhism talks about the law of karma. So whatever I do for good or for ill of that, I shall be the heir. So if you, if you think about uh, a conscript from the Russian army who has been conscripted, his mind will be a mess. If you think about a mercenary, his mind is a mess. Or you could even think of someone maybe who's pacifist and who volunteers for uh, Red Cross duty or something like that in the war, 
their mind is going to have PTSD. So socially, you, you, you would get praise or not praise, but inwardly, we still have to, you know, we have a mind, we have emotions. These are very sensitive beings. So you can't just say that there's no consequences. All, all of life, all our intentions, all our actions are consequential. Um, and, and, and so it's good to, to reflect that, that Buddhism talks, the teachings of the Buddha from the way I use them, talks in, now I've mentioned this, but in kind of two avenues of approach. One is the personal and social and relationship way. And the other is what you might call phenomenology. So, so the personal is when we talk about our relationship to each other, to the land, our personal responsibilities. And that's when we use the sense of I, I am Viridamo, I'm a senior monk here, I have my responsibilities, I have my um, monastic rule that I live by, uh, I inhabit a 75 year old body and so on and so forth. Um, and we employ the sense of I. So in this, we have the, like the five precepts. I undertake the training to refrain from killing living beings. I undertake the training from refraining from taking that which is not given. I undertake the training to refrain from uh, sexual misconduct. I undertake the training to refrain from lying. I undertake the training to refrain from consuming intoxicants that harm, make me careless and stupid. And, and those are training rules. They're not like absolute moral principles, but those training rules are rules to protect society and to protect me. Kind of um, very, very common sense things. Um, and then there's generosity. You know, we're encouraged to be generous. So in, in, in a Buddhist sense, well, the kind of basic style is do as much good as you can in the world and as little harm as possible in the world simple enough and you can see how if that's the base, basic basic ethics that i live by the consequences for my heart and mind are going to be much better than if i don't have those suggestions and and boundaries and and so on so there's one part of our uh, social life which is restraint not doing refraining from and there's one part of our life which is doing generosity uh, the Brahma Vihara is compassion, and so on and so forth. And that's when we use the sense of I, I, I undertake the training. And then if we, if we talk about the other part of Buddhism, that's when we can look at it as, as like the phenomena of, of mind, the phenomena of consciousness, that we are emotional beings, and that we have memories, we're sensitive, we hear things, and we smell things, we feel pain, we feel old age, feel youth, whatever it is. And this stream of events, you could call it stream of consciousness, is something we're always experiencing day in and day out. And it's just interesting how the Buddha then approaches that, because it's not just my participation in the life of the monastery, there's also my internal processes that are going on all the time. It's both, isn't it? And so the way the, the, the teaching approaches that internal part is by not making it personal, but trying to see it objectively. So if you take like the Four Noble Truths, the, 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 noble tr the first noble truth is that there is suffering. And, that, and that's very important to remember Buddhism. It's not saying uh, I am suffering, which could be true. I've got a toothache or I've... I've um, I've injured myself in the workshop or something like this. That's true. And at that level, I take care of myself. But what the teaching is trying to do is get us to reflect on the phenomena of suffering and, 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 and take this kind of witnessing posture or objective attitude to the very nature of suffering. So suffering becomes an object that I observe rather than uh, I'm just a subject who is always suffering. Now, why is that important? Well, both are important. If I, if I, like, let's say, a couple of the monks here suffer from Lyme's disease. So on the personal level, they take medications and all kinds of things to try to alleviate the, the very real pain and, and inertia, nausea, and all kinds of things that Lyme disease can cause. But also 
they can observe Lyme, the symptoms of Lyme disease as phenomena of pain or, and in the mental aspects of that, of disappointment or depression or annoyance. And they can find a place in their own minds which can witness the pain and not add another layer of suffering by getting depressed or getting angry or, or just feeling uh, very, very sad and, and, and uh, futile about it. So that, that part, that witnessing part is very, very important because there is, there is something in our conscious experience which is very stable. Now, although Buddhism always talks about uncertainty, we're always talking about that it's uncertain, it's uncertain. The reason I would think that that's pointed to is to, to also indicate that there's something which is stable. And what is it that's stable? If you don't find that which is stable, then you're a leaf in the wind just being blown around by emotions and situations and all the rest of it, sickness and happiness and all the ups and downs of life. So we try to deal with the social, with the external, with the uh, response, the social responsibility of our lives in a way which gives us the maximum amount of, of possibility of actually witnessing the experience of consciousness. Because if I am caught in war, my mother, my mother used to say anything but war, anything but war. Those are horrible, obviously. But if my mind is so caught up in PTSD or the trauma of war, it's pretty hard to witness that. It's pretty hard, isn't it? And, and one feels for those people on so many, so many, many levels. So those of us who live in relatively peaceful situations, the opportunity there is to, to live a really, really good life, to really do as much benefit for society as we can because that gives a good result for the heart creates good societies but not just to leave it at that but to see that that stability we, we get from living both a moral life and a generous life of being socially responsible ecologically responsible and so on that creates a foundation from which we can understand the, the spiritual side of our being and that which is stable i've been using the word stable for the past week for some reason and so what is what is it that's stable well where do you find stability in changing bodily feelings where do you find stability in changing sounds or all the mass of thoughts and emotions and memories that we have as human beings well the, the secret is that kind of witnessing posture because you can not only not only can i <clears throat> Not only can I feel an emotion of worry, say, or a, a kind of scenario of worry in my mind, I can also say to myself, worry feels like this. And that's what the first noble truth is about. There is suffering rather than, oh, gosh, I'm, you know, what am I going to do? We have these problems, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I have to deal with that. But also, I can adopt this kind of witnessing sense of objective awareness and that's the, that's the key to the spiritual part of our lives, I would say, because that's how you find stability. And it's, it's curious, isn't it? By noticing the changing nature of experience, you find that which is stable. And that's the only thing that's stable, that, that knowing of change. So if you, if you didn't have that, <clears throat> then I think life would be pretty desperate because you'd be trying to you know, hold everything so it doesn't change. Good luck. <laughs> or you just obliterate the mind with some, you know, some distraction. Good luck. That's not going to work. But there is, there is something in, there's something very stable in our experience of life, and that's the, the knowing change. Curious, isn't it? And yet, what happens is our attention is usually, if we don't have that objective witnessing, understanding, I think it is an understanding, it's not. It's not like an experience like, you know, eating some ice cream or drinking coffee or something like that. It's not, it's not a sense experience per se. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's maybe the container for sense experience. Dif dif difficult words for this. But like in the meditation, I'm saying, I said, listen to sound. Now, when you, when you establish that listening, what happens is you're not preferring the sound. If you're preferring the sound, you're, you're not really listening. You're analyzing and judging and getting attracted or, or whatever. But you just take sound, whatever it is, traffic, chainsaws, kids playing in the streets, doesn't really matter. It's just sound. 
and you let sound become conscious. You let sound into consciousness. And, and, and in that, although, although the sound is changing, there's the stability of presence. And then you play around with bodily feeling. And rather than like focusing on the breath and concentrating, what if you just allow bodily feelings to be conscious? So they come up into consciousness. If you, you feel the pressure on your seat, maybe your knees a bit sore, you feel hot, you feel cold, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You're just witnessing how things, are, how, how the body feels. And then you say to that, and that's in awareness too. So now you create a perception that rather than I am in the body feeling this pain, which is the subjective, you come more to the witnessing, say, yeah, but bodily feelings are in awareness. But so is sound. And begin to get the sense that awareness isn't really a kind of location in the middle of your forehead. Because the middle of your forehead is actually in awareness. Or your eyes, or your ears, or whatever you want. Then you begin to see, now if I can just learn to abide as that witnessing awareness, where, where might that take me? Well, it won't take you anywhere but here, but it certainly won't take you out into the complexity of suffering. So in the first noble truth, you say there is suffering. That's actually a very profound statement. People, people miss that. Well, of course there's suffering. Yeah, I have, you know, I've got ingrown toenails and I had too much pizza yesterday. I got indigestion and I've got arthritis. No, 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 no. That's self. That's subjective. Yeah, that's true. You need to deal with it. But also. There is dukkha, there is discontent, there is pain of Lyme disease. And it's really, our, our monks are very inspiring this way because they have, have developed a really strong practice around really horrible physical states and the mental states which come with that. Why? Because they've, they've, they've opted to treat the illness as, as good as possible. So that's the social part take care of the body. This is the body that I need to take care of. That's very important. But then, but then the body is not really reliable. It's not a very stable place. So having taken care of it, without dismissing that, then where is there stability? Well, awareness can know bodily pain. It can know heat and cold. And it's very, very subtle. It doesn't fix the hot or cold. But it does get you to a place where you can bear with hot and cold and actually begin to find peace within the changing nature of a painful body. And then we have the emotions. The deer are romping around in the grass over here, <clears throat> distracting me. Emotions, emotions. We, we, we love our emotions uh, uh, sometimes. Uh, here's one. Try, try this. Like, can you, can you really feel sadness but not be sad? Does that make any sense? Can you, <clears throat> can you feel anger but not be angry? Can you feel fear? but not be afraid. Do you see what that might be? It's a, it's a take something like anger. <clears throat> There's a difference between anger and hatred, correct? Hatred to me seems you're really lost. You know, hatred is just this lack of forgiveness or, and it's really invested with a sense of I and other and so on. That's hatred for me. That's the way I use language. But anger itself, arises according to causes and conditions, according to the way the stream of consciousness has been conditioned. No one wakes up in the morning saying, I'm going to be angry at three this afternoon. It just arises. It's triggered by something. So it's natural. Now, we have to be responsible for it. But what would non-attachment to the arising of anger be? You might think that non-attachment means you never get angry. Well, good luck. <laughs> To get irritated or whatever. So rather than just, you know, kind of say to yourself, I should never be angry, which is not dharma. It's just self-perception, idealism that you put on yourself. When anger does arise, <clears throat> 
What would be the witnessing posture of anger? Well, it would know. It would know that anger feels this way. And then you could know the feeling of anger, but not be angry. And what if you did that? Well, if you didn't do that, you'd be at a mental asylum. We all do that to some extent. <laughs> because if we just followed every emotion which came up, of course, we'd be, we'd be totally neurotic. So we all do that to some extent. We all have that. But have you ever really, like, like with anger, that's a really strong emotion or doubt, but have you ever really just felt anger? What's anger really feel like as witness? Or doubt or, or, or fear or sadness or loneliness or grief. These are natural phenomena that come and go. And they're not a threat. It's like Lyme's disease. It's horrible. But there is a chance to be at peace with Lyme's disease. It's a tough practice. I don't know if I could do it. <laughs> but these young monks tell me it's possible. So sorry to them. But, but our, if our refuge is obviously body or emotions or, or, or social realities, then it's always very shaky, very shaky. We do our best. But what if we then said, when the negative emotions arose, what if we said then, that, well, what does it really feel like, this emotion? Like maybe grief or, or, or some kind of discontent, boredom or sadness. What is it really like? And that, that means that now I am no longer resisting it or, or, or demanding that it be otherness. I let it become into consciousness. I let it come into consciousness, which is the same as sound. That's why I always suggest use very neutral and, and um, non, yeah, very neutral situations like sound to get a feeling for what this sense of awareness and witnessing is like. What does that feel like just to witness? When you're not trying to figure something out or analyze it or go somewhere else, just presence, witnessing, feels like that. And play around with the senses, bodily sense, smell, you really neutral things. If you do that and you build on that basis in your, in your meditation, then your meditation isn't really dependent on any sense experience. So if your meditation goes a bit funny and you have some pain somewhere and you have to move, that's not a problem. Because witnessing can notice pain, can notice moving. And, and so you develop a kind of facility of witnessing and being aware, irrespective of the of the, the quality of the experience. And this is why like silent meditation, situations where you're not too intruded by sense objects or responsibilities is very, very helpful, very important kind of training. But obviously it can't just be, hopefully we're not just into quietism. You know, that my whole life is somehow avoiding complexity and, 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 and um, responsibility so I can just be quiet in my little meditation zone. That to me wouldn't be a full life. It would be an avoidance of life. And to me, it seemed it would probably mean there's some hidden stuff there that, that might get triggered, you might regret it. So it's not about quietism to me, but it's about finding that, that place of witnessing, which is quiet, and then seeing in ordinary life, <clears throat> why is that not possible? And the interchange with people, what, what's this mind that, what happens in, in complex situations? Now the complex situations will bring up complex emotions. That's the way it works. But the witnessing is not complex. It just forgets, you kind of forget. So say, um, like, like I always talk about my own fears. So I began to see that, that the fear wasn't the problem. The fear was just social anxiety and so on that was a part of the stream of consciousness. For some reason, it had been conditioned into the mind. I didn't know why, but there it was. So it wasn't my fault, but it was my responsibility because if I didn't pay attention to it, I would just become more fearful. So then that idea began from Lopo Semedo's suggestion of, well, can you, can you really feel fear, but not be afraid? So what does he mean by that? Well, when I witness an emotion, negative emotion like that, I can, I can see where it wants to go into thought and into self-view. What am I gonna do and this is going to happen? Or 
I'm never going to forgive her or they're terrible people. That is when I become fearful or I become angry. But when I just step back and say, yeah, anger is this way. Wow, it's really tense in there. Or, whew, the mind really is throwing up stuff. Wow. That, that attitude is one that knows and fully feels and fully feels the fear. I'm not trying to get rid of the anger now. I'm just fully in, in the experience. But there's the witnessing. And what happens when, if you do that, then the witnessing actually gets very, very strong. Because now the things which have tended to create a strong sense of self and strong self-narratives and all the rest of it, now they no longer are threatening. Because even that I can know. Even that I can be aware of. And so the confidence in witnessing, the confidence in awareness, and the peacefulness of that becomes more and more apparent. And you have more and more confidence in that. I was speaking to a friend in, in, on a Zoom call to, to Bangkok and, and something really strong came up for her and she felt she had lost the plot. But then I, I said to her, well, you practiced right speech. She said, yep, I didn't open my mouth. Could have, but I didn't. And you didn't kill anyone, did you? She said, no, 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 I kept the precepts. So I said, then, well, how do you know you weren't practicing rightly? And I thought she was really. And what happened is something got triggered and some strong emotional volcano came out of her. But is that wrong? Like, is that wrong to feel some strong emotion? Is that somehow my practice is wrong? Well, if you say that, what happens if it happens? If, and that's why I think earlier on in this talk, I said there's a difference between anger and hatred. There's a difference between fear and cowardice. Yeah. But, but if something erupts in the mind, some doubt or whatever, it is natural. Anger is natural. Fear is natural. They just are. They're conditioned phenomena that come and go. And so in this second way of looking at stream of consciousness or looking at the phenomena of a mind, what we're doing is by looking at it objectively, by seeing this change in nature of our inner world within our social contexts, we begin to see that by knowing change, you find that which is stable. In the knowing of change, you find stable. So I can say to myself in the midst of self-doubt, maybe, you know, some self, you know, I mean, am, I, am I really worthy? Am I up to this? Or guilt? And I have the presence of mind to say guilt feels this way. Or self-doubt feels this way. And, it, and I'm going to really feel it now. I'm not going to blame myself. I'm not going to blame my mother <laughs> or whoever you want. I'll just fully feel this now. This is a chance to fully know, say, guilt or something like that. That seems to me a big step in the spiritual life. Because it's not just about finding a better emotional feeling. It's now accepting all emotional feelings as valid. And that's when you kind of go into the fire. Now that's self-indulgence. Self-indulgence is go in there and then thinking about, oh, I'm terrible, I'm terrible, I'm guilty, I'm guilty. Let's really feel this. And that's thought. That's not full feeling. But full feeling um, is, is, is a kind of trust, trust and awareness that this will not overwhelm. This, this, is, this is not who I am. This is not my home. This is addition phenomenon. These are, these are uh, past karmas or whatever coming into consciousness. So I've, that's, I mean, this, this really works well for me. And, and um, then as the mind begins to, to have the courage to witness these very powerful things, then as they are no longer a threat, the heart can abide in a sense of witnessing. And you find that that witnessing is very open hearted. It's not constricted. It's not, it's not controlling because it accepts all things and rejects none. And we begin to, to see why we quite often talk about awareness and compassion, awareness and loving kindness actually being one package. They're, they're not really, really separate. Because for me to accept my own fears, I had to be open to them. And that's an aspect of loving kindness. 
an acceptance of something quite unpleasant and emotionally threatening and negative, blah, blah, blah. And so loving kindness is not just like liking things. It's like allowing things more, allowing this thing to come up into consciousness. And then what's the fear? What's the fear? So our real home, as Ajahn Chah would say, is not the emotions, it's not the body. We have responsibility. We have a real home. I have the monastery and so on. I have my responsibilities. That's a social part. But then my real home, that which is reliable and, 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 and that I could always turn to in the midst of Lyme disease or uh, COVID or whatever it is, there's always that, that, that possibility of refuge. So we use everything. We, we use everything to gain more confidence in that, I would say. And this is the sense, I mean, like the experience of COVID was a scratchy throat and in industrial quantities of cough syrup <laughs> to, to try to alleviate it. So I did all of that. But, but always there's, oh, yeah, COVID feels this way. And this will change. Now, you could say, well, what if you die? Well, that's changing. <laughs> that's a real change isn't it <laughs> and then what happens well i don't know i don't know what happens when the body dies but it seems to me the most the best shot i have at understanding what awareness is in the context of a body is to be aware of change the rest of itself so again you try that like as homework this coming month or whatever like, like when, when something negative arises in your mind, can you really feel that and yet not be that? Does that make any sense? What's well, the difference between really feeling annoyed at someone in the, in the Loblaws grocery line when they get in before you or they're not social distancing or whatever? What does it really feel like rather than becoming angry? Huh? Do this all the time and make that very, I would say, make that very deliberate, that kind of experiment and let things come up into consciousness. They, they, they're not a threat. They're not a threat because if you can be open to all these different things, then you, you find that, that that confidence in, in witnessing, you begin to sense there's a deep silence there and you begin to prefer silence to noise, the noise of thought. You, you incline towards silence, stillness, openness, space. Space is a very good perception to kind of bring into the ideas of awareness. Concentration is, is not so much about space, it's about object. But space, and that's what I was trying to do, listen to sound, feel the body, listen to sound, feel the body, that these are in awareness, you start to get a sense of space. And space, conscious space, then is a real sense of letting go. These are subtle things that you can experiment with, but the whole object of it is not, you know, the object of Buddhism is not to gain some perfect experience because that doesn't exist, but to find that which is, which knows the changing nature of experience and which is truly peaceful, which is the spiritual part. A moral life, a generous life is a necessary part of that, obviously. All right, I'll leave that for your reflection. Shanzi. Uh, let's all say three sadhus together. Andamayam Ovadatata Sadhu Karankadama Se Sadhu 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 Anumodami. Long Paul, hope that uh, everyone at the monastery is now well from COVID. Um, how are you doing? He's, Amrishiri um, has a stuffy head. What I <laughs> and well, I, I think we're all well, and, and, and uh, Ajahn Pavro has a scratchy throat. But, yeah, we're, we're like kind of 90% there. Thank you. Yeah. Are we? Everyone's speedy recovery and good health. 
Thank you. Do you want to do a Q&A or should we cash in our chips? Uh, yes, we will now move on with our Q&A session. Uh, we'd like to invite anyone who has any questions for Long Paul uh, to please click on the raise hand button and we'll invite you to unmute. There are no questions yet. Uh, Long Paul, maybe I have a question. Please, Shenzhen. <laughs> uh, uh, what is the kind of karma that leads to beings uh, being physically in involved in wars or even start wars? And uh, how should we, one avoid creating such karma? Thank you, Long Paul. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> But I, I do know that the more I live in a moral universe and I associate with moral beings, the less chance there is of violence. But on a larger scale, I, I have no idea, really. That's too big for my mind. But I, I, I think the question is, what would I do if I was in the Ukraine? Well, as a monk, I think, I think we have a couple of Ukrainian monks there now from our tradition. I think they're in Poland helping with refugees. So that's what I would try to incline towards, I suppose. But I, I you know, those larger questions of, of creating good karma and what are the consequences? My mind doesn't go there very much in seeing because to me, I, I really don't know. But I do know that the more I can live, first of all, a moral life, an impeccable life, a life of generosity, then the people around me are of a similar vein that I'm protected a lot from, from things, but that's no guarantee. And then also that I develop a refuge in, in awareness, then that's my best chance at handling. But if they started to bomb Tisserina, I don't know what I'd do. I'd probably melt. <laughs> so I, there's, 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 you know, there's no guarantee that way. So I'm very kind of, although, I, I don't think much about past lives or future lives. It seems to me to be too, I don't see the point of it really. Um, but I know there's enough work in this life. And I, and I trust that however things work on a larger scale, that doing the best I can in this life will take care of it. And this is complex enough for me. But why, you know, why was my mother in the Second World War and that? I wonder if you can really if it's really possible to just that one person did one thing and they had this one result, I suspect it's much, much more complex than that. And I don't know, you know, I can't, I can't see, well, if you do A, B and C, then you'll never be in a war, that kind of thing. But my real love of Buddhism is not so much about good rebirth, but it's the end of rebirth. So that's another reason why I, I, I don't kind of go there. And then what is rebirth? And then I look at it as in terms of ego as that. And then what is uh, unconditioned? What is not born, what does not die? And that language really appeals to me. So I've never been a very kind of rebirth buff <laughs> kind of guy that, that sort of, sus in fact, I find it a little bit boring actually. So, um, but, but I do know that like, like some people will say, well, you were, you were, you were a monk in a past life. Maybe. Sure, yeah. But so what? Maybe I, you know, maybe I was a poker player in a past life. I don't it would make much sense, but but to me it's 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 the kind of a speculation which creates just another layer of ego. You know, I am someone and then I was in a past life, and I am someone and I'll be in a future life. And that whole whole way of thinking is what we call Atavada, or Sikhaya, or personality, that I am someone born in time, and then born again in time, and then born again in time, and that, that, that may be true at some level, but the whole point of Buddhism is that you don't buy into Atavada, Sikhaya, the personality, that I am someone who will become something, because that's what we call Avijja. 
So should Zing in, in Paticha Samupada, we have Avija Pachaya Sankara, Sankara Pachaya Vinyana, and so on. Avija means self view, personality view. And that's in the whole dependent origination arises, but it can be chopped up when there's no longer the whole sense of Avija. So to even think, what can I do so that I'm not reborn in the future is, is Avija. It's, but if you, if you right now look at Avija as, as the whole sense of self and look at that as an object, you know, that whole, that whole way of thinking is just an object that arises and ceases. Then you're inclining to the deathless, to the unconditioned, the uncreated, the unoriginated, the unformed. And I think that's very important in these kind of dialogues that you just have about, you know, this kind of birth and that kind of birth. That's all very well and good. But is that really what the Buddha was teaching? He might have indicated that those are possibilities in terms of the transformations of consciousness. But that was that the import of his teaching? Was that, was he pointing to, or was he pointing to the unconditioned, the uncreated, the unoriginated, the unformed, the deathless? I think he was. That, that was the point of his teaching. So if we get too much caught up into past lives and future lives, I think we miss the Buddha's teaching. So when that, when that language comes up, we say, yeah, yeah, but who, who says that? Who thinks that? What is that? And that becomes an object, and you begin to abide or incline towards the unconditioned. That which is not born does not die. And that language doesn't get presented much in Buddhism. What gets presented a lot is change and, and the instability of life, and the instability of, of sense processes and that, and, and also making good karma, making merit. But then that whole teaching there is the unconditioned, the uncreated, the unoriginated, the unformed, the deathless. If there were not that, there would be no release from birth and death. That I think, I think sometimes Theravad doesn't emphasize that enough. And yet the whole, it seems, you know, the Buddha's enlightenment was that, was that realization. You know, he didn't, he didn't, his realization wasn't how to get to heaven or how not to be reborn in a war zone. You know, that wasn't his realization. He just, you know, his realization was, 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 was transcendent. So I would, I would like, when, when Buddhist communities get into those kind of speculations, you can do it, you can do it, but is it profitable? Or does not that create another sense of self, another layer of ego, another sense of self? That was a riff, wasn't it? <laughs> I didn't think I'd go with it. David, Glenda, how are you? Unmute yourself, sir. you didn't there you go there you go hello glenda again how you doing thanks I, uh, I should just comment on uh living with covid certainly has brought us into a place of total uncertainty and unpredictability hasn't it right it's a, right yeah it's a and major cancel the birthday party. And, we, and so far we've avoided it and we're being very careful but uh, it's hard to get rid of the, the fear of, oh, what's going to happen if we do get it? And can we keep, keep doing this to avoid it? And la, la, la. And how long can that last? And it's a, I've got it's my a... antibodies. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> um, what question? Glenn, did you have a question? Yes, I do. And it's around, um, I've been struggling with insomnia for the past several years. And so... I, I was, I've been working with it by bringing mindfulness in when I'm laying there and I can't fall asleep. So go to the body, listen, sound, you know, keep coming. when my mind starts getting panicked, like, oh my gosh, I won't fall asleep. Like, um, just keep coming back to, to, to um, you know, presence. Um, and, and then recently I've been trying, um, okay, this is, this is anxiety. What does anxiety feel like? This is, um, you know, there's um, death terror here, right? Because there's a thought: if I can't fall asleep, I'll keep getting more ill, and then I'll I'll die young. So it's death terror, uh, fear. So it's like I find um, it's still I can't fall asleep. <laughs> it's sort of like I'm because I'm still caught up somewhat. So I'm wondering, it's like the ego, the me is so preoccupied 
with the death of not being able to fall asleep, the death of brain cells, of getting dementia, right? That I'm still lacking something, obviously, as I lay there trying to be mindful. So how many years has this been? Uh, it's been really heightened since uh, menopause hit uh, because I guess estrogen helps with falling asleep, apparently. So probably the last seven, eight years. Are you dead? Not yet, but my, <laughs> my brain is getting more okay. and more. All right, there's a good one. Are you, have you, have have you seen any brain? Have you seen any brain cells on the floor? That no. <laughs> but I'm getting more more dense and, and uh, memory problems. So am I. <laughs> but one thing I would question is the idea that you cannot be aware in deep sleep. So it is possible for the body to, to uh, rest and still be aware. So the 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 underlying idea which is seems to be holding your fear is an idea that sleep is a certain way in other words you become unconscious and if you don't have that then you're not sleeping properly so then then the aversion you have to not fall into sleep creates the fear and such like so why don't you like use like what could we say say a more kind of experimental approach okay um i'll just let it be the way it is and see did you know how am i the next day you know it wasn't really that bad did i spill the milk all over the floor or is that something that i'm creating about the next day and so just take the evidence of a night and just accept that, okay, I can't fall asleep. Um, and, but is the result really that bad, evidence-based? But if you try yoga nidra, did I suggest that last time, Glenda? Yoga nidra. Um, the thing about yoga nidra, lying meditation, it, it's, it's strength, I think, is in not moving. When you, when you toss and turn and you want to fall asleep, you move a lot, correct? Yes, that's true. Right. So you, you, you're trying to basically annihilate consciousness by bouncing back and forth, left, right, left, right, and so on. Yeah, definitely. And, and that aversion to not falling asleep makes you, of course, more restless. So the idea of yoga nidra is that you don't move, you know, that you lay down in sarvasana posture, and you, I think I, I explained that you get your knees up a bit under a pillow, get your small, your back comfortable, you get your head comfortable, sarvasana, corpse posture, and then you make not moving the meditation. And you'll find that you really want to move because you want to fall asleep. Now, if you can, if you can introduce that into the insomnia, even for half an hour, sometimes you'll find that you fall asleep, but also sometimes you find that Actually, you're very restful. You're very rested, but you've been mindful for you. Being aware through, through deep sleep. Um, so let's say for myself, my, you know, I got, I'm 75, so sleep patterns have changed. Um, and because I can do yoga nidra, it's, 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 you know, it's quite interesting in, in that way. And I can see if I want to fall asleep, it's a desire to you know, the desire to turn on the side, I can do that too. So I, I, I would say, first of all, look at that, that movement of the body all the time, back and forth, I can't fall asleep, and just try, just try like yoga nature for a while, just stillness, stillness of body. And because um, it's huge aversion, a lot of people have that, they have this fear of not sleep, and so on and so forth. And, and because of ideas that seem pretty natural and then you'll read an article you need eight hours sleep and then that'll really set you off right so don't read any articles about sleep <laughs> when you see the headline but but actually I, I know it's it's like especially if you do get like an hour of sleep and you wake up at three or something like that and then you look at the clock and it's a total disaster you know then then that's a really good time to yoga nature go to the washroom 
have a have a, some water or something laid down and just see, just, just kind of give it a go. And it's the stillness of the posture, which I find very helpful. Do you get the kind of, uh, what do you call, shaky leg syndrome? You get that one? Uh, I don't get that, but it's like I put my head on the pillow and it feels so incredibly uncomfortable that I have to constantly move my head, readjust it. Okay. You, like that's ear, what you have to my ear gets really sore well whatever posture you take at some point you're going to have to notice the discomfort as an object right rather than be the subject of the discomfort right. you know the difference right yeah observe it exactly yeah and just name it discomfort feels this way and of course your mind doesn't want discomfort it wants something else so it keeps moving that's why like yoga nidra on your back is, you know, it doesn't crush your ears or anything like that. It doesn't crush your shoulder. You, you know, it's all kind of balanced. And then discomfort that comes up is actually, you can say, well, that's just discomfort. See if you can just be with the discomfort rather than need to move all the time. So there's two reasons we move to get more comfortable but also to, 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 to annihilate consciousness by, by being on our side. That's what we're used to doing. So now by establishing a sarvasana, the, part of the corpse posture, and, and making a determination not to move. You know, it's not rigid. It's not like, I'm not going to move. It's not that. It's just, no, I'm going to explore the desire to move. So the desire to move is related to some extent of wanting to fall asleep, and not wanting discomfort, now you're looking at desire. Not, you know, just by observing the desire to move, look at desire, and the mind begins to calm down. And so if you can see it as an experiment in this, rather than a technique to fall asleep, if you think it's a technique to fall asleep, then you're just buying into that whole desire pattern. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say what Monk said, I'll do it. Okay, I'm doing it, I'm not falling asleep, this isn't working. <laughs> That's, so you're 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 quite pure in your observation uh and and curious does that that kind of makes sense yes that's very very helpful i i have not explored that I, I'll, I'll, I'll get the sense that if you could do that even if you don't fall asleep you'll be more rested you are you can it's amazing the, the body can have deep, deep relaxation. And, you know, the great, say, in the great yogis in the Advaita tradition, they talk about awareness persisting through waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. This is a common thing you find, uh, I think, uh, Lompalian. Yeah. Our, our own teachers have said that. And, and, and those of us who do yoga nidra, we swear that sometimes, yeah, the awareness went right through deep sleep, and yet you feel rested. So all those models we have about sleep are, are I mean, they're scientifically true and they're valid, but maybe awareness can actually, you know, consciousness is possible. It's always there. It's just our identity with the body and ego, I think, that, that doesn't allow that experiment. It's worthy of investigation rather than just, oh, I've got this problem. You know, and that just kind of hypes the mind even more, doesn't it? Yes, thank you. It feels uh, really we'll, good. We'll look for her brain cells in the morning. Just make see <laughs> yeah, if there's fruits. Swing them up and put them put them in a little pot. <laughs> <laughs> thank some, you. Uh, I love your humor. Okay. Laura. Thank you, Lung Paul. Uh, we have another question. Laura's there. There we go. Laura, if you can unmute yourself. There you go. Hi, Laura. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I am new to uh, you and this group. I am uh, not too far away in Ottawa. Uh, I hope that when COVID uh, permits, I would very much like to uh, go to the monastery and uh, see that beautiful place you speak of, beer and Orioles included. Um, I, I, before I pose my question, just because I am 
talking to you, I'd like to uh, explain a little bit about uh, why am I here and uh, what am I seeking? Um, I received a what has been called a life-limiting uh, diagnosis about eight months ago. And um, this situation has brought me to places where I want to explore um, what I need. I need to explore um, serenity and peace and acceptance. Um, so this is why I am here. In, in today's talk, uh, my question is specifically about this, um, the question you pose about how do I feel anger, but do not become angry. And I am wondering if, if a place to start is first to remember yourself when the anger arises and then not engage, not engage. And so I, I, I'd like to hear what your, your thoughts, your views are on that. But also, um, does it apply equally to what we name or brand a negative feelings? Like, how do I feel anger without becoming angry? What about joy? How do I feel joy without being joyful? It is it's that that sounds so counterintuitive to me that I'd like to hear your thoughts on both those questions. Thank you. Great question. Thank Laura, you. just be, before I answer, yes. yes. Do you think do you think consciousness is a physical phenomenon? I don't know. I, I, I am very um, puzzled. I, I will tell you a little bit about what happened to me. When, when I was given this diagnosis, I, it, it, it me, some, some in me, I don't want to say I because I did not decide. It never took it personally. <laughs> I very right. instinctively accepted it as the universe. And for the first time in my life, I understood there is a universe I don't want to call it God. I don't want to, uh, I don't, there is a universe. Maybe that's consciousness. I don't know. This universe is unfolding exactly as it should. I may not like it. I may not understand it, but uh, this is happening because I have a job to do. And what I need to do is figure out what that job is so is there consciousness is consciousness something physical i have no idea it i am i don't know well whatever insight you have is obviously very calming and, and very wise some intuition in you has this wisdom to say okay this is the lesson this is where we go Okay, so back to your question about fully feeling anger, not being angry, fully feeling joy, not being joyous. Um, when, when you feel the loving emotions, like let's say if you feel uh, compassion for someone suffering, and that seems like a really good emotion, but if you run with that compassion and you, you, you take it on, you can get very, very worried and upset about someone suffering. Whereas when you take compassion and you just know compassion and you connect to the person and you have no agenda of having to fix it, you can fix it. You can do what you can, but you really know compassion just as it feels. Then you're directly in contact with the person. Same with joy. If you see, experience uh, springtime 
and a great joy arises in your mind, if you fully feel that joy, then it's a full experience that arises, stays with you. If you run with that joy and get excited and so on, you actually lose the joy because you've caught, you're caught in the mind, you're caught in thought, you're, you're caught in abstracts, you're caught in restlessness and so on. So to fully feel joy or to fully feel anger is the same thing because our emotional world has these kind of dualities. But what's interesting is when the ego part falls away, when the greed, hatred, and delusion falls away, then our connection with life is no longer um, blocked or hindered by our own preferences, by our own uh, perversions, our own uh, biases. It's open to the way things are. And in that openness, there's, a, there's an appropriate response. This response might be silence. The response might be joy. The response might be compassionate action. It doesn't really matter. But the response now is because the heart is free, free to respond. Whereas when it's caught up when it's, with its own preferences and desires and biases and angers and all of that, with its own history, it's not available to that. It's not available to beauty. It sees beauty every now and then, but then it retreats back into its own thoughts and ideas and, and all of that. So I would I would suggest that in what you're going through, fully be with sickness, fully be with whatever whatever it is there, and see that that which knows isn't sick. That which is aware uh, is something is is really your spiritual home. And it can be with all things and fully being with it. Then there's no fear. And that to me is really what open heartedness is about. L loving kindness is about this acceptance of the, of the complexity of the, of human birth and human emotions, but in itself um, is, is a refuge. It's a refuge of, of, of knowing, knowing clearly, but I, I, you know, I'm really, you know, you know, the, the insight or your, your wisdom or intuition when this came to you, it's really wise. You said, yeah, I'm not the body. You know, this is just, just the universe saying, okay, here's a lesson for you. Let's go for it. And that's really commendable. It's really encouraging. So please do come. Who you're commending, not me. The universe. That's it. The universe. There you <laughs> the go. The universe Thank said, you. yes. I, I do go. feel it as a, I, 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 it came to me. It simply came Brilliant. to me. Yeah, it's, it's not it's also interesting because it's not the overriding emotion is not fear. It's never been. It's Brilliant. profound sadness. sadness. And so okay. I find very interesting when you speak about how 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 can I feel sadness and not feel sad? It's very yeah. hard. Very hard. But you understand the principle. And I, yes, and I, I, I try, I try to do exactly what I am asking. I try not to engage. I try to say, oh, oh yeah, okay, this is sadness, but I try not to weep. Yeah, yeah to, to have like a direct perception of something like sadness without all the thought processes on top of it is very, very difficult. But you're going yes. right. You're really looking at sadness before concepts, before the sense of self, before all those structures come into play. And do that. Do that with nature. Like, mm -hmm. like look at a, a, a blossoming cherry tree. The cherries are in mm -hmm. blossom now, apple, right? And just yes. look at a cherry tree and just let it come to you without the comment. Isn't that beautiful? Or that's a cherry tree without any thought. Go directly yes. to the perception. And then do the same thing to sadness. Because that's what you're doing. No comment. It's like this. And you go right towards it. What's really like? And then trust in that. Okay. All Thank right. Thank you. Thank you. Bonne chance. <laughs> Thank you. How many is it? Okay. Shenzhen, are we, have we covered the field? Yes, uh, in the interest of time, maybe we'll end the session here. Okay. Uh, maybe sure. invite Lompo to lead us in the...
Metta Sutta Chan. That would be nice. Let's do that. Shenzhen, I have some the song is here, so we'll do the audio, okay? Yes, your song is okay. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties, and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would like to be proved, wishing in gladness and in safety may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, May all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, upwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, Seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Okay, everyone. See you next time. Thank you, uh, Ciao. May we all pay our respects to Lompo with uh, three bows. First bow. Second bow. Third bow. Nice to be with you.